Yesterday, uh, we were in Cordill watching my daughter's team play basketball, and it was one of those games that just was coming down to the wire, and we were down by a point with just uh, probably right under a minute left to go. And the other team had the ball, and the girl had the ball under our basket, and she got disoriented, and she went up and scored a basket for our team, which actually ended up being, you know, helped us win the game right there at the end. And, you know, you felt bad for her, but at the same time, you realize, you know, we've all been in that place where we just get disoriented. Uh, I, I related to my own story in high school playing basketball that I wasn't very good, as this illustration shows, but um, uh, one time... I got on our team, Chad Hall, he brought down an offensive board, but I was disoriented, and, and I, I thought that it was a defensive rebound, so I ran down to the opposite end of the court and couldn't understand why no one was guarding me, and I began to scream at Chad to throw me the ball for an easy layup, and I remember it just it stuck in my mind, he just held the ball, and he looked at me, he's like, you're on the wrong end of the court, and, and I took the walk of shame back to the, my end of the court. Being disoriented, we've been there, we've done that in, in various areas of our lives, and that's exactly what's happened with the churches of Galatia. They received the gospel by understanding that it was all about grace, it was all about Jesus. But then they were being disoriented, they were being taught by these Judaizers that now that they had become believers, they had to come back and embrace the law again and believe the law in order to, to maintain their relationship with God. And, and so they started out right. Uh, my brother played golf in high school, and his senior year, I was back in West Virginia, and he said, let's go out and play some golf together. And I, I mean, I played like three times in my entire life. And, and so the first, uh, the first uh, tee we were on there to drive, um, he drove, and it was okay. It wasn't great. And, and I hadn't played in years, and I got up, and I just got really lucky, and I just, you know, straight down the fairway, beautiful drive, past his ball, and, and I kind of looked at him with pride, like, yeah, like that, and then he looked at me with this look, and, and it was that look that says, I think, yes, it's an old golf adage, it's not how you drive, it's how you arrive, and, and it's true, because the whole rest of the day, it was like, you know, out the fairway, in, in the rough, you know, in the water, over and over and over again, and, and so I started out really, really strong, but starting out strong is not always the most important thing, it's, do you stick with it, are you, are you, following the right path. And so the Galatians, they started out right, but it wasn't how they started out. It's how did they arrive? And so as we look at Galatians chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 today. And my original intent was to go through verse about verse 12, but we're not going to be able to do that because uh, you don't want to be here for two hours today. But we're going to look at verse 1 through 5. And in this chapter 3, he's going to make, Paul's going to make some arguments for why they need to stick with the faith and not mix in these works for salvation. And, and so the first five verses, it's kind of a personal argument. He's saying, hey, think back about how you receive Christ. And then in, in the subsequent weeks, we'll get into the rest of his argument, which is a biblical argument that he pulls out way back from Genesis 15, and looks at Abraham, looks at the Old Testament, makes an argument there as well. So in these verses, he's going to call their attention to what they experienced. And so we're in Galatians chapter 3, and we're verses 1 through 5. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing when you heard? Or what you heard. Verse 3, are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it is really in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by, by your believing what you heard? Let's pray. Father God, this is your word. It comes from you. God, you said your word will endure forever. It's eternal. It's lasting. And God, we pray today that our hearts will be open, the Holy Spirit will work in our individual lives, each one of us, so that, this, that your word will penetrate into our very being, God, and change us. Help this not just to be another sleepy Sunday, safe within the walls of, of, a, of a church setting, God, but help it to be a time that really moves us toward you and closer to the cross. 
somebody we walk out of here a little more in your likeness and more eager to to make a difference in this world for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple things we need to remember from this uh, book that we've been studying. This idea of legalism is a topic that's been coming up over and over again. And at its core, the, the, really the main definition of legalism, it says that law-keeping is the foundation for being accepted by God. That you have to keep the laws. You have to do the things in order for God to accept you. And there are a lot of religions that believe this. They believe that, hey, yeah, you come to Christ by faith, and then they put a plus symbol after that, plus doing all of these things. And maybe you've even grown up in a tradition like that. It says, okay, come to Christ, but now you have to do all these things to maintain or hold on to or keep your salvation. And Paul is going to make it very clear. In fact, in, back in, in chapter 2, he was very adamant that they are saved only by trusting Christ. And and our efforts, the, our moral um, efforts we put into this, or the law, or trusting anything else other than the work of Christ, is not the true gospel. And the gospel is the way that we enter into the kingdom of God. But now Paul's going to show in this section that the gospel is so much more than just the way you start out. But the gospel is the way that we live our lives, how we grow in faith. We grow by the gospel. And so we come to Christ by faith, but these Judaizers were sort of saying, okay, sure, you come to Christ, you believe in Christ, we do too, but now here's what you have to do. Go back, look at the law of Moses. You need to do these things in order to really be in right standing with God, to be an insider, to, to really, really have a relationship with God. And so they were relapsing back into this legalistic attitude. And so the first thing I want to show you in verse 1 is this relapsing into legalism, it just went against common sense. It just went against common sense. Look at verse 1. He says, you foolish Galatians, all right? Not real kind. I mean, you see Paul here has, it's a mixture of anger and even a little bit of surprise because he had really, really worked into their lives the truth. And here they're abandoning that. So this idea of foolish doesn't mean they're stupid. This idea of foolish means, you know what? You're smart enough. You should know this. You should be aware of this. You should know the truth. But you're, something's happening. In fact, he uses the word Who's bewitched you? Who's cast a spell on you? Who's caused you to think so dis disord uh, dis distorted about the gospel? So someone cast a spell on you over this. So it's almost like surprise. Like he's not referring to like literal magic here. He's referring to the fact that he's just, it had to be from some outside source because I taught you better than this. I prepared you better than this. And it reminds me of uh, the story I read in the news some time back about this, this painting that was uh, in this art show. And this is a true story. I don't know if you saw this. It's been in my files since August because I, can't, I didn't wait to see it and I mean, to show it to you and, and to kind of tell the story. But here, this field trip, this group of kids is coming through this art exhibit in Taiwan. And this kid stumbles and he falls and punches a hole right through a piece of art that was worth, what's it say, $1.5 million. $1.5 million. Okay, my thought is, it's not the kid that's foolish here. It's the people who put this art exhibit together, right? Because who puts a $1.5 million painting that close to where an accident could happen? I mean, it's a foolish thing that somebody would do that. And so that's kind of the idea here is, it's like, what are you thinking? You know, duh moment, right? Why would you have the gospel, the true gospel, be convinced of the true gospel and then turn from it? Look at the rest of verse 1. He says, they relapse, this relapsing into legalism, it goes against the cross. He says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as, cru as crucified. So he couldn't believe that they would accept the fact that Jesus had come to earth, the Son of God, die on a cross for their sins, yet so quickly then after they accepted that and see, I need the cross for my salvation but now I'm running back to this idea of I've got to do stuff and keep the law. And I think this idea of clearly portrayed, portrayed as crucified, that he's saying, I worked super hard. I preached to you like with my whole being because they weren't there. They didn't see the crucified Christ on the cross. But he's saying the idea here is he painted such a vivid, heart-stirring picture for them. And that's the thing about salvation that when you come to Christ, it's not just a, oh yeah, sure, I believe that, and then you walk away and do your life. 
when we truly see the cross, when we truly see Jesus crucified, something happens beyond just an intellectual ascent. It's something that happens in our hearts. We see that the Son of God came and died for our sins. And that's why I think, and even this morning on the video we were watching in the parenting class, I thought about this because I think even though it's totally true, sometimes it's only partially true in the fact that it leads people kind of down the wrong path. That sometimes our whole idea of salvation is just getting to heaven. Getting to heaven. And so what happens in so many churches that salvation just becomes my passage, my ticket, stamp my ticket to my internal destination. Got that, did that. But then this idea of what's between here and death, here on the other side, then that's just sort of my business and I do my thing. But I don't think that's true salvation. True salvation is seeing Jesus high and lifted up. Seeing him on the cross and realizing the cost that was paid for our salvation. And so Paul, he's painted them this vivid picture. They've seen Jesus on the cross, but now Jesus was out of focus. The focus was blurry. The cross was blurry now. And what were they doing? They were turned in looking on themselves and saying, okay, now I've got to do the stuff. I've got to keep the law. I've got to measure up. I've got to work hard. And they took their eyes off Jesus, and it became about self-effort. And these false teachers, known as the Judaizers, were saying that in order to be right with God, you needed to follow the Old Testament law in addition to believing in Christ. And so they were mixing this together, and they were trying to tell them you had to earn it. But to Paul, and you're going to see later in this book, a salvation that says Jesus plus something else It's not salvation. It's not the gospel. It's a false gospel. And so I I encourage you, I mean, implore you, I guess is a better word, if you sit here week in and week out, or if you're a guest today, realize that salvation is found only in Jesus. Yet we talk about this, and we talk about it, and we talk about it, but still you ask people the question, they say, yeah, I hope I make it in one day, or I hope I get there. You see, it's an inward focus. Jesus is out of focus. The cross is out of focus. And the focus is on self. And so God justifies us. He makes us perfect. He makes us right before him. And at the same time of our salvation, he sanctifies us. He declares us holy. There's nothing you can do to make God accept you and love you anymore. There's nothing you can do. And so we're going to see in a minute, obviously, if our hearts have been changed, like Paul talked about in 2.20 last week, chapter 2, verse 20, Christ lives in me, this life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. He's saying, I don't live anymore. It's not me that lives for myself. I live for God because I saw the cross. And it changed everything. It changed everything. So let's pause right here for a second, all right? Let's hit the pause button. We've been to church many, many times. But is your heart moved by the cross? Or has it become just, I've heard it, I've seen it, done it, gospel. I got it down. There's no emotion tied to it. There's no passion tied to it. It's just purely something that, yeah, go to church. That's what I'm supposed to do on Sunday. should be a bad warning sign. We're going to see more of that in a minute. But look at, look at the third thing that he, he points out. He says, relapsing into legalism goes against the work of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 2, and then let's look at work, verse 5, and then we'll come back and get 3 and 4. He said, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So again I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So he's asking questions over and over. He says, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by doing stuff? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit by just simply believing and putting your faith in Jesus? In fact, 
all believers, and some churches teach differently than this, and the scripture is clear about this, that all believers, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9, it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have salvation. You don't have not seen Christ on the cross, high and lifted up, and embrace that life for yourself. And so you receive the Holy Spirit by grace through faith in Christ, but then they turn around and they say, okay, now we see the Holy Spirit did all this in our lives, but now we're going to try to do it on our own. Verse 3 and 4, are you so foolish? He calls them fools again. After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it was really in vain? What he's saying is God did some pretty miraculous, amazing things in your life when you believed and received the Holy Spirit. He says, was that all for nothing? He says, I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't in vain. And he says in verse 3, you're, you're being foolish. After beginning by means of the Spirit, now you're trying to finish by means of the flesh. I think the picture that came to mind, you'll get a little insight on how my weird mind works here. You know, I, I thought about a family who's driving cross-country in a nice car. they got a convertible, nice weather outside. They're driving cross-country. And there's just the father sitting there, and he's just steering the car, and the car is doing the work to get them from Bainbridge to out to Los Angeles. But what happens when you get to about Arizona, and you say, hey, let's try a new approach to this, all right? Let's get one of those cars like Fred Flintstone had, you know, where you, where you get there and you, you run the car the rest of the way. That's the picture I get from this, that the Holy Spirit, the, the cross, Jesus, that's where they were going with. They were, they were headed to the right. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now let's put the effort in. We got to do this. We got to do this ourselves. And they began to think that they had to exert the effort in order for God to accept them. So Paul says that the way the Spirit entered your life should be the very same way the Spirit advances in your life. And so he calls them foolish again for not trusting in God for salvation, or for, for trusting God in salvation, now compromising on this gospel of grace and relying on their effort, their work. And he says, are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? Are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? What's he mean by that? Are you trying to finish by means of the flesh. Let's camp out here just for a second. We know that the flesh, if, if, if you should know if you don't, the flesh he's not talking about your skin on you, okay? What he's talking about, and most of us, when we think of flesh, you know, that person's living by the flesh. I mean, we think Bourbon Street, or we think, you know, this person who's living this bad, terrible life in the, in the, in the red light district, you know, that's what we think of sometimes. But there's religious flesh, and that's what he's getting at. He's, he's getting at this idea of, Self-determination, self-effort, self-reliance is what he's getting at. So he's saying, by means of the flesh, it's this idea that it's about me. And so the, uh, throughout the New Testament, it, it talks to us as Christians that we have these two competing capacities within us. The old capacity to sin before Christ, called the flesh, and this new capacity now we have to resist sin and say no to sin, and live a life that's godly and holy. And someone who doesn't know Christ, they don't have this com competition. They don't have these competing natures within them because they don't have the capacity for godliness because they only know a sin nature. So if you don't know Christ, you know what? You can do some good works, but your motivation ultimately is tainted by your own sinfulness, your own selfishness. So that's why Scripture is very clear that there's no good that can be done by someone who doesn't know Christ. And, and, and one who doesn't know Christ can't show the love of God because they don't know God. And so for the Christian, trying to finish by the flesh means that you ignore this supernatural thing that happens in our life that enabled us to then be able to serve God and to live in a way that's pleasing to God and to listen to God and obey his will. There's something supernatural that takes place there. And they moved from that supernatural to this eyes on myself, what I can do. Let me, let me give you just a couple examples of ways that we practically that we do this, because I think it would be helpful for us to see how we practically do this. Let me tell you one. 
disinterest in prayer. Disinterest in prayer. Let me ask you this. When do you really, really pray? When do, I'm, I'm talking to myself here too. When do we really pray? When we're desperate. When we're desperate. When we're at the end of our rope, something bad has happened, someone we love is sick, we know that we can't make it to the next day. And all of a sudden, we tune in to the supernatural because we know this is beyond me. This is beyond my ability. There's no way. But what happens is when we begin to live in our own strength, we can manage it, then prayer becomes an afterthought. Prayer is not important. Because we got it. We're managing it. We're pulling it off on our own. See, that makes it real personal, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Because we all know how bad we are in our prayer lives. Because 99% of the time, we live this life through our effort. Jesus, yeah, I believe Jesus. Put my faith in Jesus. But now I'm going to live this life by my own proof. You never ask God, God, reveal to me your will. Show me, God, how to live this day for your glory. Well, I know. I know the Bible. I know Scripture. I know all this stuff. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to live it out and be aware of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in and through us. What's your prayer life like? What's my prayer life like? I'm just like you. Most of the time, it's just, am I desperate? I think about the story of George Mueller. He was a guy back in the 1800s who ran an orphanage in England. And literally, they had no resources other than just believing in faith that God was going to provide for these children that they had housed. And they would get down and they would pray every night, God, provide for us. We literally don't have food to put on the table. And Mueller said it never failed. God provided. Because God loves when we're desperate. Because we realize there's nothing we can do out of our own strength. It's all him for everything. You know, you think about the time back when Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And he said, give us this day our daily bread. You know, during that time period, that was important because... They didn't have Walmart with every million kind of food that you could buy. They didn't have the luxury of all the the, the ease and the the, the systems in place that provide all our basic needs. I mean, getting fed was a matter of life and death for them. Getting their meal that day. And so do you think that it had a little more urgency than when we pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread? So what's it going to be? Is it going to be this frozen meal, or do I make something fresh? I mean, we have so many choices. There's no dependency, dependency on God. And prayer is an indicator. Are we living our lives through our own strength? Or are we living through his power? Let me give you another example. As a church, do we rely upon programming, or do we love people? Let me, let me explain to you. I love this. This, this quote by Bob Goff, he says, Organizations have programs, people have friends. Friends trump programs every time. I love that. It's not because programming isn't important and organizations aren't necessary, but friendships and relationships have to be the top priority. And you have to see these programmatic things that we do and the things we put in place as opportunities for relationships to happen. And so I, I think about you know, people who work in children's ministry, or for me, like I worked in youth ministry for years. It's so easy to just go in, okay, what's my script? What do I do? Okay, they got this going on today. All right, all this, okay, let's go do, do all the stuff. And we go through the programming, but there's no thought in. God's working through people, not through programs. God's working in lives, not through being entertained or having things set up, the system set up that they work perfectly and flow exactly the, the right way. Life on life. And I, I remember when I, in youth ministry, some of this is a matter of training, so take responsibility for a lot of it. But, you know, um, our, 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 our leaders oftentimes, who were parents, 
the kids would be here and they would be in the back, you know, oh, hey, shh, don't talk. And, th and that was the interaction with the kids because, hey, everything's running fine. John's got this covered. He's got the program covered. I'm in the back and, you know, I'm just kind of, and I, I love those leaders who, and we have some here, who, who jump in there and do life with these kids and, and sit at the tables with them or, 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 or take them out to eat and spend time around the table with them and interacting with them. Because it's that life on life stuff is where change happens. And programming has value, but where we impact others is relationships. And let's not forget that as a church. Let's not forget that as individuals. First John 4 eight says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You see, that's a supernatural thing to love because Christ is in you, the Spirit is in you, and out of that flows the source for which we can love other people and reach other people and share Jesus with other people. This idea of love in Scripture, God's love is this agape love, is the word, and it's used to describe a love that only comes from God and it's his very nature. He is love. And so out of Christ in you, then we can love. That's a supernatural thing. And the flesh says, I don't want to be bothered by people. And so we can identify moments when we're walking the flesh, which is most of the time for me and probably most of the time for you, is people are an inconvenience to me. You know? Ah, sure, I like some people because... They make me feel good, but I don't want to go my way to love people that are difficult to love or love my enemies. And that's what Jesus says, love your enemy, because that doesn't come from the flesh. That's only a supernatural thing that happens when Christ lives in you, and that love flows out of us from our relationship with him. Romans 5, 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. How? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. His love has been poured out into us. And as a result, we're a conduit and we can pour that out into other people. But when we default to the flesh, to self-effort, to moral rules and regulations and doing the things that relieve our conscious, conscience. We're walking in the flesh. But when we walk in the Spirit, we can love those who don't love us back. We see the value and, man, I need to pray because there's no way that I'm getting through to that person or, or anything good's going to happen at that event unless God steps in to the situation. So those are some practical ways that we can see whether we're walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit. If we're living by law and duty and effort or living by the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. Because, you see, this legalism thing is so subtle. I mean, it, 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 we get the idea that salvation, okay, is by grace through faith in Christ alone. But then it comes to living the life, and it's a, it's a little more tricky. But the truth is the same, that holiness comes from the gospel. This faith walk comes from living out the gospel. And I think so many people reject the church and reject Jesus because, as Christians, we show them a false gospel. We show them this gospel of self-effort of living by my own strength, my own power. And they come to the church and they say, let me check it out. And they just see us living through our own efforts. There's no supernatural power there. And they say, I don't see anything there that draws me. But what happens when a church, when a people, all of a sudden become desperate for God, dependent upon God in our lives as a group and as a community? And we say, God, we know nothing good can happen if you don't show up. It's a whole different spirit. It's a whole different atmosphere that's created. And as a church, that's 
what we have to be as individuals. That's what we have to be as, as, as a home with our children. That's what we have to be through the power of God and through our relationship with him. So people don't reject the gospel because the gospel is irresistible. They reject us getting in the way of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15.10 is a good reminder, though. I want to end with this. Grace isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Paul said this. The same guy who's writing Galatians said this in Corinthians. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No. Look what he says. I work harder than all of them, yet not I. Get this. This is the important part. Yet not I but the grace of God that was with me. So he's saying through that grace of God, through the Holy Spirit, out of that comes his effort. Out of that becomes his desire to live a holy life. What we call the, the theological, theological term, progressive sanctification, becoming holy, becoming Christ-like in our practical daily lives. And so grace isn't saying, I'm checking out, I'm just, you know, let go, let God do all the work. You know, Paul says, through grace, I make an effort. I work harder than you all. So I'm going to give you some practical things to help us understand how to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. First of all, acknowledge this often. Apart from Christ, I can't do anything. Apart from Jesus, I can't do anything of value. So you're going through your day, and you're at work, and you're interacting with coworkers, and there's people who are negative, and, 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 they're, and they're using God's name in vain. And instead of saying, oh, I hate working here, you say, God, without you, I can do nothing. You acknowledge that, God. Nothing, the kingdom can't come to this place if you don't show up, God. And in the flesh, no good thing comes out of John. And no good thing comes out of you. And John is dead. The old eye is dead, as he said last week in 2.20. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You see, your approach changes because you're desperate for God. You're dependent upon God. Second thing we talked about, pray without ceasing. Pray all the time, the scripture talks about. There's this constant just prayer that should go on in our lives. And it's not... Thou holy as God of the universe who created all things anew. And, I mean, although those may have their place, we're talking about a real living dialogue with God that goes on in our lives. Trust. Trust and faith that the joy gained through Jesus is better than whatever counterfeit Savior that is tempting you at the moment. Counterfeit Savior. What are you putting your hope in? What are you putting your trust in that's not Jesus? Because these counterfeit saviors will prove themselves to be what they are, fake, ultimately. That relationship, that new job, that goal I have in sports or in recreation or whatever it is we do, if those things begin to say, you know what, that's my goal, that's what I'm after. We say, no, by faith, God, I trust that your way is best. That that over there is counterfeit. It's, it's a sin. It's fake. And ultimately, it will prove itself to be that. And I say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, as Scripture tells us. Next, just be thankful to God. Because ultimately, it's about giving him the glory anyway. That's why we're here to glorify God and enjoy him. So we were thankful. God, thank you. Because nothing good comes from me. And I thank you. The only good comes from you. And thank you for allowing me to choose by faith that your way is the best. And I'm going to walk in that. And then one that we often overlook, and as a church, sometimes we do a good talk about it, but it's not really there in most of our lives, is humility to enter True, honest community. Real honest community. Because we have superficial relationships, and then we have you know, some relationships that are slightly closer. But when it comes to actually people who truly, truly know us, 
Most of us don't have people like that. And I was reminded of the value of that this last week. A friend of mine who lives in, in, in uh, Texas called me. He said, John, man, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with some stuff up here in my head. How many people do that? I mean, how many people actually admit to someone that they're struggling with their thought life over some things? People don't do that. Christians don't do that because I'll look weak or, wow, they knew what was really rattling around in there. They would reject me or I just, I, they're not allowed in there. He said, John, man, I need some help. I need some wisdom. And the cool thing was I, he, he, he needed some guidance in a, in, a, in, a, in a decision directly related to this. I said, I need to talk to somebody else. I don't really have a, the best answer for you. And it was cool. I went to the coffee shop the next morning and was able to sit down with a couple from our church, and actually they gave me some wisdom that kind of changed the direction I was going to give him. And so you see how that worked? Just Our lives were open, and they were real. And so it's not this accountability that maybe you've been a part of before that's all about behavior. You know, did you do that? Oh, no, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's about real life, knowing one another. Not just changing somebody's behavior, but the heart being changed because Jesus becomes Lord of more and more of our lives. It starts with being real and honest with ourselves. How strong is your desire for Christ-likeness? You know, our desire will always be stronger than our actual performance. But where do we go when that happens? When you say, John, I really do desire, but man, I'm such a failure. I would encourage you, if the desire is there, if your heart burns for Christ's likeness, for, for Jesus more and more in your soul, even if your performance falls short, you're in a good spot because you want more of Christ in you. If you'll follow through on the things that I just said, real life accountability, prayer, depending upon God, trusting Him, giving Him glory, those things, then those, those actions and those desires will begin over time to become more and more like Christ. But for those who are like, eh, don't really have that desire, that's, I, mean, that's, I mean, honestly, that's a real, real issue. Because how can the Holy Spirit, God Himself, take resident in, residence in your life, and all of a sudden you just say, don't really have a desire to be like Christ. And that's not really there. That's a, that's a big problem. But what about those who really you do desire and you fall? What's the answer to that tension that exists? The answer is the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the assurance in the gospel that we've died to the guilt, listen to this, to the guilt of sin, that you don't have to lay there and beat your head and say, how can I do that again and again and again? I'm terrible. God, you hate me. You despise me. No, because the guilt of sin was removed at the cross. And Romans says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What an awesome thing that you can lay your head on your pillow at night and know that God doesn't hate you God doesn't think, why can't you get your act together, together better? What's wrong with you? That God embraces you and loves you. And as you embrace more and more of him and his grace, through that comes the strength for him to live through you and to live that agape love and love others because God lives through you. So do we make an effort? Absolutely. But we make the effort in grace, through God's grace. Because ultimately, it all comes back to it's about him from start to finish. The way that you came to Christ, keep going in that way. The way the Holy Spirit came to you and the incredible things that happened in your life and the changes that were made, stay on that course. Don't allow legalism, rules, Behavior modification, just going through the motions to suck the joy of this life of faith we have out of you. Go back to the basics. It's how you started. It's where you started. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you that the hope we have for an eternal life with you, God, but help us to not be satisfied with just having our ticket punched. Help us to see that the very one who started the work in us will complete it, that you will complete the work you started. God, I pray for those who in here that have, have maybe even come every week to church, but they know there's no desire in them to be more like you. There's no passion within them to know you and to make you known. God, today may be a day that, that your light just shines down on them, that they will look deep in their heart and see if this is just a game they're playing and identify what's wrong at the very heart of their relationship with you, God. God, if they need to just put their faith and trust in you because they know they've never truly done that before, May today be the day of salvation. And God, for those who are Christians in here, all of us, remind us often that nothing good can come of us, that we fall on our face every time we try to do it on our own, but it's only through you, it's only through the cross, it's only through the gospel that we find the strength through your grace to live the life you called us to live. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.